If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. A couple weeks ago, we looked all about the work that God does within people and the story of redemption and how he changes people, how he changes each and every one of us who have made the decision to follow Jesus that we instantaneously become something new. That the old, the old is gone. And last week we looked at the expression, the next step that we take after we've made that decision to follow Jesus. And that next step that we take is, is letting the world know of the decision that we've made. And it's, it's being baptized. And we talked about the beautiful picture that baptism is and how it symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And how it also symbolizes the death of our old selves and the birth of something new when we come out of that water, just as a picture of the representation of what the Spirit of God has done within us. And this morning, I want us to see and hear a story from someone who has lived this, from someone who has become a new creation and who has had an amazing work of redemption and restoration happen in his life. And so would you please welcome Mr. Greg Tedke. I was going to say, there, there was a whistle. You're already doing better than I've ever done. So Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I mean, I might get one amen. You're getting claps and whistles, so just remember that. Now, I, uh, the first time I ever came to Lakeside mm-hmm. and I saw you uh, from afar, I said, I had no idea Terry Bradshaw went to this church. <laughs> Thanks, said, buddy. no idea. <laughs> it's you, the, just you the haircut. You are a dead ringer. <laughs> yeah. You're a dead ringer. Just the hairline. Yeah, buddy. and then I got to know you, and you say some things as crazy as Terry Bradshaw <laughs> sure, as <yeah>. well. <laughs> so, yes, I do. Now, many of you, uh, many of you know Greg. Uh, some of you have some familiarity with Greg, but I heard Greg's story recently, and I was absolutely blown away at what God has done in your life. And so if you would, just share with everyone uh, the journey that God has had you on, starting from your experiences, uh, even as a little kid, and talk to us a little bit about the family environment that you grew up in. All right. Um, I guess all the trouble really started in 1952 when I was born. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> we uh do you say i thought 42 really 52 <laughs> buddy so, i look good for it yeah <laughs> but anyways uh i was born uh in 52 uh we were always very a uh, very poor family i lived in three homes uh since i when i was born until i turned eight or 18 and none of my homes ever had an indoor bathroom uh, the, when I moved, all the homes when we moved into didn't have any uh, water. Uh, you had a pump, you know. Uh, finally, the, the home that I ended up at, the, the last home, had uh, cold water, no hot water, and never had a bathroom. So, you know, it's uh, later on that'll come into play why that was an issue. But uh, as I grew up, when I was younger, uh, being poor never was an issue. It just when you're little, you don't you don't care. You don't you don't see how poor you are. You got imagination. Everything's a toy or or whatever. You know, it just doesn't seem so bad. Then once you start getting into the grade school, the uh, you know the nine ten year old, then you start looking around and uh, it's like, why do they get all this and why do they have that and why can't I get it? Well, then it gets to the point, in my life at least, uh, some kids are really good and they're poor and, and it's not an issue and they get their own little jobs and, and make money. But I, on the other hand, went the other route and just said, I'm just taken. I'm just going to get what I want. And uh, that started me on a, on a, a bad trail of uh, lots of troubles, lots of uh, uh, police interactions. Uh, and then... Uh, as I got into my teen years, then, it, of course, then it even, it ramped up, and then the drugs become involved, uh, alcohol becomes involved, and 
You know, I look back on my life and I think how hard I was. On, I just didn't have that conscience, it didn't seem like. When I was in, I went to Lutheran school for eight years, and uh, I, I, I memorized all, uh, the, all the Bible verses. Uh, I really enjoyed, the, in my younger years, the Bible stories and the stories of Jesus and uh, Goliath and Samson. All those things were really cool. But then I, there again, I got to a point where it's like, that just isn't for me, you know, it's, and it just, it's tossed off to the side. I didn't go to church. I didn't, I didn't get into any of that stuff. And as, like I said, as my teen years progressed, I started getting into more trouble, um, uh, things like that. Like I said, the drugs and alcohol become involved. Uh, and, and I didn't care what I did, I, I, what I took. If I stole from you, oh, well, I didn't, I didn't feel that uh, guilt or pain or, geez, I shouldn't have done that. It was, I'm here, I'm, I, want, I get what I want, you know. Somebody asked me one time, Greg, why do you do those things that you did? Why did you do those things? And there's an old Bob Dylan song, and I always use the phrase, uh, when you have nothing, you have nothing to lose. Hmm. So I didn't, I didn't care, no cares. So when, when you're a kid, mm -hmm. uh, the, first, the first thing is you start to realize, okay, people have more than I have. Yeah. And then... Take us back to that thought process, like the, f the first time that you took something. And, and you talked about that, that absence of, of really, obviously we know now the Holy Spirit, you know, and the conviction, but, right. but that absence of any feeling or conscience. And you just said, I, I want, take us back as best you can to that thought process where, where you took it and then you, you didn't feel any remorse. Right. And so how that, how that helped snowball into increasing. Right. And, uh. It's like you said, I can kind of remember like going to the grocery store and uh, stealing that candy bar or, you know, it just, I, I didn't have any money. I wanted it, so I took it. And it was scary while you're doing it. It's kind of scary, but once it's a done, once it's done and, and you've done it, then it becomes easier. And especially if you don't care about it, it, it really is easy. Then you, then you amp it up to clothing, and uh, I'd steal cartons of cigarettes when I started smoking, and, uh, you know, as even older, I, I knew the people and some of the people in town that had garages with refrigerators and <laughs> in them with beer, so from before Friday came, I'd, I'd go and, and visit those garages later in the nighttime and get some beer, you know, and, but I'd never thought about, the only thing I really ever thought about is getting caught. Yes, that was my main concern, and I did get caught quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but uh, I, to, to go from there, I guess, is to get into the when when I started getting arrested, and you know, you go through that uh, uh, the court process, and it seems like as I got to more and more trouble. I, I mean, I stole a car one time. Uh, it was just breaking in the houses. And it was just on and on and on it went. So, and then I'd get, once in a while, I'd get nabbed, you know. And they'd, uh, you get in, the, it's almost the routine of the court system. It, at that time, I'd go to court. You'd sit and there's no jury. There's no, nobody defending you, really. And it's you and the, the prosecutor guy and the judge, and they make a determination. And they just say, eh, put him on probation. You know, and then you go home, and it was, it just got to be like, go to court, big deal. I'll be on probation, and then I'll, I'll go home. Well, then it got to the point where, I thought, it was going to be that probation thing again, and this was a little more serious thing. And I don't really, I can't remember of all the things I did, which was the, coup de gras, you know. That's <laughs> a, but. Uh, so I went to court, and I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, all right, listen to the ba 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 You know, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you're naughty or not naughty, but you're going to, okay, probation for two more years. And then the judge looks at me, and he said, well, uh, I sentenced this man to the age of 21 to Wales Boys School. And it was like, what? 
Did I hear that right? <laughs> and yeah, he, I heard it right. And now, uh, for those who don't know, can you describe what Wales Boys School well, is? Wales is like a holding facility for juvenile delinquents, all the way up to age 21. But it's a little more. Uh, it's not the reformatory type, but it's still uh, fenced and wired and guards, and it's a little more high security uh, facility. And how old were you at the time you stood before the judge and he said, until you're 21, you're going I to I was this. a sophomore in high school, so I was probably just turned 16 or 15, probably 15. Okay. So I'm thinking at, but he, he did say I suspend the sentence, and I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Another lifeline. And then he said, the sentence is only till the age of 18. I said, oh, <laughs> bummer. <laughs> so I, I'm st I guess I'm still gone, you know. <laughs> But then it was, uh, but it was it was strange because when I, I shouldn't say strange, but when it was, I sentenced, and I'm sitting there, and then my mom and dad were in court, and it's like they didn't even I didn't even say anything to them or say goodbye to them or I just kind of waved and they took me out, and you would have thought I was a serial killer when I <laughs> they put me in a holding cell, then they came to get me. And they put handcuffs on me. Well, they put a chain around my belt. They put cuffs on me and chained me to that. Then they put shackles on my feet. And they put me in a car. And then they took all these chains and, and hooked them to a big loop on the floor. And there I am. And I'm thinking, wow, what did I do? <laughs> this is something really bad. But anyways, all those chains on you. And then you're gone. And I was, so here you are, 15. And... You're, you're on your own. There, I didn't know anybody in Wales, you know. I didn't know, I didn't know anything. Where am I going? What I got to do? And I felt, you feel very alone. Mm -hmm. But once I was saved, it's, uh, we'll get to that part too. But. <laughs> so you get there and they unshackle you and they walk you in and it's like, what is going on? It's just, you're just a number. And I can still remember I was J29396. And I was that number for, well, over a year, you know, a year and a half. Of, and that's all you really are. Every once in a while you hear your name, Greg, but uh, most of the time the guard would just call out, J29396, show her, you know, or, or whatever. So now, you're at, now I'm in the system. And, you know, I don't know. It's, it's like you go in and you think, is this really doing anything for us? You know, you're with all these other thugs and and you and things you didn't know, you know, not, they'll teach you, they'll mm -hmm. help you. Or, you know, it's all those, it's a perfect example of who you're with, how, it, how does that affect your life. I mean, when you hang around with uh, bad guys, you're probably going to be a bad guy too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, tr I tell the youth, uh, when we have our youth group uh, stuff, and I tell them about the friends they choose. You know, the friends are going to make a big influence on your life. And as I look back, there's there's people here that are that when I, we were kids I was friends with, and we still are. But I think the most of the time in your life, they're not they're friends, but I think they're more acquaintances, because when it all comes down, they're gone. You know, they'll dime you, throw you under the bus, whatever it takes. I remember one night we were downtown in, in Algoma. It's a very cold winter night. There's about seven, eight of us standing down on, on the street being idiots and smoking or whatever. And one guy said, hey, let's go over to my house. It's, you know, go to the house and be warm. All right. So all it's eight of us start going, and we get about – a block or so down, and he turns around and says, looks at me and says, uh, Greg, you can't come to my house. My mom and dad don't want you, won't let you in there. And I said, all right then. So I turned around, and I thought, well, I'll just go back downtown. And only one other guy um, turned around and came back with me, and the other six. So are they really, were they really my friends? Eh, only when they wanted me, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's the kind of stuff you go through. And, uh, 
some people grow up with great friends and great lives right away, their Christian family. How beautiful is that? And then they, some of them think they don't have a story. Well, that's a big story, you know, to have that upbringing right from the start. But anyways, that's what I had to have to say about friends. I mean, and the guy that turned around and came back with me, he was my friend until the day he died. And he was just, that's just the way it is. And, but yeah, that, um, so where do I go from there? Back to the penal system, I guess they call it. So you're, you're in Wales Boys School, mm -hmm. J29396. That's right. Does that get your attention? Uh, not really. Talk to us about how the journey continues. It's, it's uh, you know, you're there, you're, 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 it's just, this is what it is. You got, it's like you're just surviving. It's like, uh, I know I'm going to get out, but am I going to be changed? I would hope so, but I don't know. It just, it's, it just, uh, they, didn't, they didn't do anything really. They, my education, I give them that, my education there, they, they pushed me right through. I got so many high school credits while I was there. It was, you know, I, I did really well. And in, in when I was in uh, going to school in Algoma, I guess I was too cool for school, you know. So there were many times I, I just wasn't there. I, I'd just skip out. But, uh, you know, they worked. I worked from 5.30 in the morning. And then you, I was like, I was in the kitchen, the main kitchen at boys school. And I finally, I should say, I transferred out of Wales to a minimum security facility later, about a month after I was there. So I went to a minimum. And then when I got there, I had to work in this kitchen. And I'd go in and I'd have to be up at 5.30. I'd work till 6.30 at night. Plus, between breakfast and lunch, I'd have to go to school. So it's a, what, 13-hour day? And I made 10 cents a day. So that wasn't really any incentive to go into the workforce. You know. <laughs> but it did teach me to be a good worker. And uh, so you go through that. I didn't, uh, and you know, I, to go back to those, I was there, I was there from, uh, I went in like October, and I came up for parole in May, and they said, oh, Greg, you're, you're a good, uh, you've been a good prisoner. <laughs> and... Uh, and, but then they uh, said, well, you know, we talked to the authorities in Algoma, and they said that you were a menace to society, and they really wouldn't, could, they'd rather not have you back in their community right away. So they said, now we're going to find the foster home for you. So it took another two, two and a half months to find a foster home, so I had to stay there extra. And then... Uh, and then they sent the, 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 the smart people that they were sent me to this foster farm, and, which is all right. That's cool. But there were nine other juvenile delinquents already on that farm. So now there's 10, 10 guys out of the prison system all in one big happy group. Well, do you think actually think that's going to work out? It, it, and, it, and it didn't. <laughs> Sad to say, it worked out for a while, but I thought, even as a kid I, or a teenager, I thought, man, this kind of dumb. <laughs> you know, you're just, look at, I, I mean, I, it, it was just stupid. But so, it, go so, you go to the, so you go to the farm, mm -hmm. and then what? Well, we, we actually ended up getting in trouble, you know. A few guys got in trouble by themselves, and they'd, they wouldn't be there anymore, but they'd bring somebody new in. And, you know, you hate to talk. Uh, bad about that stuff, but I think it it was all for the money. I mean, for uh, we didn't get the money, but the, the foster family, I mean, they made money on us. And I'm not speaking, foster foster care is great. Right. It really is, but the, some of the systems they throw you into, I mean, that wasn't, that just didn't seem right to me. Mm. The ones that I see, there were people are taking care of these kids, and that's a beautiful world. But to throw 10 criminals together and say, that's going to be all right. <laughs> but it didn't. And then uh, actually we ended up, uh, we had stole uh, cases of liquor. And there was this one little knucklehead. And I told my friends, don't give him any, don't give him any of that alcohol. 
he, he's, not, he's, not one, he's not one of us. <laughs> well, he wasn't one of us. He got so sick, they took him to the hospital, pumped his stomach out, and then he just dimed us. Mm. They robbed us. <laughs> and did this. And, well, then we were at the gym at the high school in Elkhart Lake, and a uh, couple of people came up and said, hey, the police are looking for you guys. And it's like, eh, yeah. you happy now? <laughs> I told you that. <laughs> so the next thing I know is the one, one of the older guys with us said, we got to get out of here. Let's, let's beat feet. Where are we going to go? We'll go home, get to the foster home, get our stuff. And I said, well, how, we're going to run? Walk? What? No, no, I got this girlfriend. We just take her car. <laughs> All right. So he's, he says we take the car. Well, I get in the back seat. Where of course, I'd been drinking. I kind of, kind of out of it, relaxed. Next thing I know, I feel this big jolt. Oh yeah, we ran into a tree. <laughs> he hit a tree, and now the car's smoking, and, and the girlfriend's crying, and it's like, oh, what are we doing? And I get, we start getting out, and say, well, we're almost home. And then I hear all the, <laughs> all the <laughs> sirens and lights and county and state. Oh, I don't know who was all there. And they all ran us down like dogs and mm. put us in squad cars. And I thought, well, I think I'm going back to boy school. <laughs> and, and, uh, yeah. and you did. And that, yes, that happened. And what's, what's interesting to me in, in your story is you, you talk about how one of your friends had a girlfriend whose, whose car you went with. And mm -hmm. this theme of, of ladies loving the bad boys yeah. uh, continues throughout this story. Yeah, it does. Because there was somebody... Yeah, yeah. No names, please. I can't. <laughs> but well, there I, yeah, was I can't somebody. <laughs> I kind of remember who she was. <laughs> who, had Actually, who had some feelings for you, as best I understand. Yeah, yeah, this I guess time. so. Yeah. It was, uh, well, I finally get out. I go back to boys' school. I get out. And, and, and I never did say anything before this started, but I'm not proud of any of this. The only time I, tell, I say anything about this stuff is to tell it that there's hope for everybody. Yeah. And that's the only reason. I'm not sitting up here for your sympathy. I'm not sitting up here to say, man, he was a bad guy, man. And none of that. It's that this is who I was, and this is what God did for me. Mm -hmm. So anyways, I get out of boys' school. And there's, you know, there's such thing that uh, all those days in boys' school, you don't remember very many of them because every day is the same. Mm -hmm. There's nothing special about it. Da, da, da. Then, then there are some instances where you go, oh, I remember that day. <laughs> you know, but, so then I get out, and I, uh, it's like, yes, I'm going back to Algoma now. And, uh, you know, my parents knew I was coming home, but uh, it was, a, it was a, one of the things that, that I remember is you come I, I, I had a couple of bus transfers, and then they bring you. I had can't, the bus used to come to the hotel Stebbins down in Algoma here, and drop you know have bus things. So I got dropped off at the Stebbins, and I get off, and I got two bags of stuff, and I and there's nobody there. Mm -hmm. Nobody came to get me, you know. And it's just uh, I don't know. I don't know how people how that can happen, but it happens and. You know, don't don't be like that. Um, if you're a parent, just love your kids, man. And it, it you know, I think that would have helped from the beginning of my my time. You know, my dad was he was all right, but he'd go way beyond what discipline was sometimes and stuff like that. But uh, so here I am home, and it's like, and then I, well, I start walking. And I get to to Grover's was the pool hall, and there's some guys, and they see me, and it's like. <laughs> I had some friends. <laughs> but anyways, uh, then I was home for a while, and then uh, Pam Moss moved here from California. And uh, the first time I saw her, I thought, wow. <laughs> this, is, this, is not a, uh, this is not a Wisconsin girl. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not saying that. No, I didn't. Okay, I'm out of here. She had this long, long blonde hair. She dressed different. That's what I meant. 
I, I would just stop. The okay. hole's just getting deeper. So, yeah, anyways, I saw, I saw Pam, and I thought, wow, that's a nice-looking young lady right there. And, uh, and Wisconsin has a number of nice-looking oh, yeah, young there ladies were, as well. Oh, well, like, there were many. Yeah, uh, okay. Many that I was attracted trying to. Help. I was, many I was attracted to, uh, uh, Wisconsin women. So, anyways, uh, Pam, and then uh, apparently she thought I was pretty cool, too, but there's that bad boy attraction again, you know. I don't know. But then as, as we went along, um, you know, I was still in trouble. I was still getting in things, drugs, whatever. So that's how good the, the juvenile and the prison and jails work for me. Uh, it, it just amazes me that it, it doesn't ha it. I guess that you got to have something in your heart, some kind of feeling or, or know something prior to, to that, you know. But then, anyways, Pam and I would would uh, date, kind of, not really, but we'd go see us, each other at some function. Or, and Pam wasn't the wasn't Miss Innocent all the time either. <laughs> <laughs> so and you point fingers at me, but <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, and, then, and like, uh, but I to believe it or not, I was really shy. And I had a hard time time talking to to ladies or girls unless I was drinking. And then I was Mr. Smooth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I could talk to anybody or so anyways as time we we started dating, we'd have our uh, my drunkenness and I'd be a big idiot and you know, it just never we'd spat and you know. And then Pam's mom was like the the most strong, strongest Christian woman I've ever known, you know. Mm. So this is, this is her daughter, and she knows a whole bunch about me. Mm -hmm. I think she had my j record. She, she, looked at, <laughs> she looked me up. Or something. They didn't have the Internet then, so she had to go face-to-face -face and get files or whatever, but she knew a lot about me. Somebody just w once asked her, how did you get through that, Marianne? And she said, Oh, I just got raw knees from praying, <laughs> praying, praying, praying. And, uh, and finally, Pam and I got more and more, uh, you know, dating and doing things. And then sure enough, I got, and many times you get the rep of being bad, and many times I'd get arrested for absolutely no, not arrested, but picked up for no reason. And the last time I was in jail, the very last time, was for 21 days, and I was in there for questioning. 21 days. Hmm. And I tried to ask uh, if I could get a lawyer. <laughs> There's got to be something going. This doesn't seem right. But apparently when you're on parole, you, got some, you lose some of that. So I'm in jail now. My, this is the last time, and Pam's mom, Marion, comes to see me. And uh, we're in there, and uh, I'm in jail. And that, that day, I'd had no thoughts about God or Jesus or the Bible anything never there was no thought of that in my head and uh, Marion came in talked to me for a while and she gave me this magazine from Billy Graham uh, Billy Graham uh, Ministries it was a decision mag magazine she gave it to me and I glanced at it and blah 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 and you know you always make the lame excuse but then I as she left I went in and I actually read the decision magazine and it was all about uh, the prodigal son. And I started reading that, and as I read it, it was written a little different, and, you know, but the, it, it's, it's the prodigal son story. And as I read it, I thought, man, that's almost like me. You know, I had, I loved Jesus and, and all that when I was little, and then that, then I said, I, I'm out of here, and now all of a sudden I'm at this moment where it's like, this is this is all about me almost, and then I got to thinking, um, wow, I wasn't looking for God. Can you believe that God actually came to that jail cell looking for me, man? Mm. Wow. <laughs> wow. So when when Jesus went from the head knowledge from the Lutheran school and all the verses you memorized, yep, and invaded the heart. Yep. How? And you know, there, I was in that cell, and I just, 
Uh, they actually had a little sinner's prayer thing in there, and I prayed that. And, uh, you know, it just felt, there was no big thunderclaps and light, big lights flashing or none of that stuff happened, but it was, you could feel it in your, in your heart or your soul that stuff was taken away, you know. And uh, like I was saying before, when I had all those chains on me, and when I got to Wales, they took them all off. And I didn't have chains anymore. But little did I realize I had all kind of chains on me, yet, mm. dragging them around. And I, I believe at that moment, I lost all those chains, too. Yeah. So, Jesus said in, in the book of John that if the Son has set you free, yeah. you are free indeed. That's correct. And I am free indeed. So then, I, I, to wrap it up here, what do we got? We're almost done. Uh, <laughs> I know you're happy. <laughs> so anyways, uh, I got out of there. I made that decision. Was I perfect? No, by no means. But things start changing. And, and uh, the one thing you've got to realize is when you make that decision, you don't do things. If you say, I want to follow Jesus, but then I'm going to have to do this and have to do that, that's not going to work for you. When you, when you say you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to say, it's going to be... I want to do that, and I want to do this. Have to and wanting is two big differences. And I started changing. Uh, Pam and I finally ended up getting married, engaged and married. And uh, uh, before I had my, before Heather was born, our first daughter, uh, Pam and I both said, we're done drinking. We're not, no drugs, we had given that up, but drinking a little bit yet. And I said, my, my children will never see me drunk, intoxicated, never. And, I, and that, from that day on, I've never had, we've never had a drink. And it's pretty, feel a lot better, and you're not so cocky and uh, <laughs> stupid. And then, uh, I mean, life's great now. God's blessed me. I still sin. I still stumble. We, we have uh, tragedy in the family, like people dying and moms and dads. It's just... That's just the way it is. But now, you know, I look, I got two beautiful daughters. I got Pam. We just, Pam and I just celebrated our 47th wedding anniversary. Yeah. And about a, about a month and a half ago, we had, got our first little grandson, little Joe's over there. So... I mean, what else can I tell you? God's blessed us. Uh, and can you believe I live in a house with two bathrooms? <laughs> <laughs> so it's been, a, it's been a rough ride, but then it went to, uh, like we were saying back there, you, I was in a big valley, way down in there. But, you know, eventually God got me back on the mountain, and there's still little dips, and, you know, you, you get it's life, man. Yeah. But... You've got to realize there's hope. If you hope in your family or your friends or your money or your job, I'm telling you, it's going to let you down. Hmm. But if you put your hope in Jesus, he said he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Yeah. And what else do you need to know? Let's thank Greg for sharing his story with us. Thank you. Thank you. If the sun has set you free, you are free indeed. And some of you right now may feel like you're J29396. You might be marginalized. You may be a number. You may feel insignificant. In many respects, you may be. You may feel isolated. You may be alone understand the same God who ran through someone to a jail cell to pursue Greg is the God who's running after you. And he loves you. And he sees your chains. And he sees your hurt. And he sees your mistakes. But he's offering you freedom. If you would just give in and give yourself over to God. That is the hope 
of what Jesus has done for us. And that's available to every single one of us. When we say, God, I can't do this on my own. I'm not enough. But you are. So I give my life to Jesus. Take over and change me. And if that's a decision that you need to make, I know Greg would love nothing more than to talk with you after the service day. I would love nothing more than to talk with you after the service today. If today doesn't work, set up at a time to meet with us. Set up an appointment. Let us talk to you about the hope that's available to you. If that's a decision that you have made, the next step is next Sunday. Right after the service. We're going down to the lake and we're going to celebrate the change that God has done. And so it's not too late. If you've made the decision to follow Jesus, it's not too late just to tell everybody, hey, I've made this decision, and to follow those next steps. God, thank you. Thank you for your restoration. Thank you for your redemption. Thank you for the work that you did in Greg's life. The divine appointments that you put in place. And God, the change that's come about. As, his, as a result of following you and his surrendering to you. So God, we thank you for what you've done in his life and we pray, God, that we would all surrender. God, I pray for the person here today who's fighting it. And I just pray, God, that they would just quit fighting. They would realize just just how much they need you. That they would realize, God, just how drastic the chains that they find themselves and their situation are. And God, they would choose freedom. Freedom available through your son Jesus and what he accomplished by dying for our sins and raising again three days later so that we could experience hope and we could experience life. God, I pray that for those who've made that decision, they would just take those next steps and they would just proudly proclaim that. And God, we as a church would come alongside them and celebrate that decision. We would cheer them on and be their encouragers. And God, here at Lakeside, that we would always be a place of grace. We would be willing to accept people no matter where they are in their journey so that we can point them to you, that we would see lives changed. And we'd see people grow closer to you as a result. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.